welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Now, what do Benjamin Disraeli, Winston Churchill and Boris Johnson have in common, apart from being Tory Prime Ministers? They were all prolific writers and indeed wrote most of their books when they were MPs. To that notable band of scribes, we should add former Liberal Democrat leader Sir Vince Cable. As leader of the Liberal Democrats, Cable's one of the few minority party MPs with the clout to make an impact at Prime Minister's questions. Mr Speaker, the, uh, the House has noticed the Prime Minister's remarkable transformation in the last few weeks from Stalin to Mr Bean. <laughs> Assuming control of a party still in trauma from coalition politics, he left the leadership and parliament in 2019 on the crest of a mini wave and as literary output has soared. The, the Today, question, Alex speaks to him about his latest book, Money and Power, which charts how, over the last three centuries, 16 key world leaders have transformed their country's economic fortunes. But first, to your tweets, emails and messages in response to our show last week on Northern Ireland, The Forgotten Crisis. Donald Gilly says, excellent show, Alex. As a small exporter and carrier, we deliver into Northern Ireland often, and although costs and paperwork have increased, the system is working well from Scotland as is. Lisa Cunningham says, another good informative show, Alex. Glenn Payton says, I certainly would hope the billion pounds given to Northern Ireland's DUP for votes would improve their figures. It was a nice lift to add to a depressing past. Alistair Smith says, finally, British mainstream media are virtually ignoring what is happening in Northern Ireland. Who are the world leaders who use their political power to change the economic prospects of their countries? In his latest book, Vince Cable has chosen 16. He tells Alex the reasons for his selections. So Vince Cable, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Uh, this new book, uh, Money and Power, the, the 16 world leaders who, who changed economics. I suppose I've got two initial questions. One. How did you choose the 16 from the last 300 years? And secondly, virtually none of them were, were economists, which is kind of bad news for you and I, Vince, but uh, how come they can change economics and none of them, or virtually none of them, were economists? Well, uh, as regards the first, 16 is a bit arbitrary. That's where I finished up. It could have been 10, it could have been 20. But the, the bigger question, which I think is of interest to you and I, as people who did economics in our youth, um, is, is, is that there is this sort of popular view that, you know, economic policy is a kind of anorak type thing. You know, you've got these clever people like Mervyn King who um, sort out economic policy in Britain. Uh, and on the other hand, you have politicians who do politics. But actually, the big shifts in economic policy that we've seen, you know, good and bad, you know, really originate with politicians, um, who a few of whom have an economic background. And I, of course, as you know, I was in the government in, and you were in, in Westminster in a different way. We were dealing with economic policy a lot of the time, but most of the people we were debating with uh, didn't have an economic background. And, and so it's the connection between the two is, is what really grabbed me. I noticed that you used that Keynes quote, uh, that uh, people who are practical men who, who don't think they're the, the recipients of intellectual influence are, are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Uh, so in your experience, were, were people who were pursuing economic policy, even though they didn't realise it, uh, following the precepts of, uh, of one economist or another? Yes, I, I mean, I'm sure that's absolutely true. I mean, some, some of the... The big figures in this argument, you know, were quite open about their where they got their ideas from. I mean, Margaret Thatcher had read Hayek, um, and she uh, dropped the name of Milton Friedman. I don't know whether she ever read his books, um, but others who were, you know, really big figures before. I mean, you know, Roosevelt, probably the, the most important figure of the 20th century, at least in the Western world, was influenced by all kinds of people uh, who. You know, he never referred to it, probably never read their books. Uh, and, you know, Keynes was writing him letters. So, you know, that, that kind of stuff was in the background and had a, had a major influence. You know, even the, the, the man I finished up with, who is Trump, not that I like Trump. I mean, a dreadful character in many ways, but by switching off uh, globalization, 
which is what he did through economic policy, has had a massive effect on the way the world runs. And he he was influenced in the background by by you know various people who had um, you know written you know anti globalization nativist kind of philosophy. Um, and you know he, I don't think he ever read books, but he was certainly influenced by their ideas. Well, let's look at the the, the book then. The I mean, you start your first chapters on Alexander Hamilton, uh, gloriously, uh, and then uh, uh, you climax, if that's the right word, on Donald Trump. So let, let's talk about Alexander Hamilton first. I mean, yeah, a founding father of, of the United States, uh, founded the Fed, of course, or the equivalent of the Fed, and the dollar. Uh, but was he an economic innovator, in your opinion? Uh, or, or did he copy the best practice from elsewhere uh, and introduced it in the new nation of America? Uh, well, he was massively important, and one of the points I make in my chapter is that on all normal measures, he should have become president of the United States, but he didn't. I mean, he picked fights with people, yeah. Jefferson... He's more famous, th thanks, to, thanks to the musical. He's, he's more yes, famous he, than any he, president. He, he got himself shot eventually. Um, but, yeah, he was a massive economic innovator. At that time, we're talking the end of the 18th century, you know, the only kind of semi-industrialised country was Britain, uh, and he defined his views in relation to, you know, British ideas. But the thing that Alexander uh, Hamilton is now most famous for is uh, the defence of, uh, you know, a protective wall around manufacturing and building up American industry. It was a very agrarian country at the time of its independence. And, um, you know, th these were ideas he largely thought through himself. I mean, he wrote letters to dozens of people around the world saying, you know, does manufacturing matter? You know, should we bother with it? Do we really need to have a textile industry or an industry making iron? Um, and it was the replies he got that he put together to formulate his ideas behind uh, protected manufacturing, a very sophisticated economic arguments based on so-called infant industries that we, we hear today and were copied by many other people through the years. In terms of the UK figures you've taken, you've taken uh, Peel, uh, I can understand why, and Margaret Thatcher can also understand why. Uh, both politicians of the Conservative Party, uh, you know, weren't there left politicians who, who made great strides in uh, economic uh, thinking over the last three centuries in the United Kingdom? Yeah, there, there were, and I, I was, I mean, you could go back to the 1906 governments, uh, Lloyd George and Churchill, certainly, then post-war uh, Attlee, Cripps, and so on. They, they, they were, you know, major figures. Um, but certainly the post-war Labour government, it, it's, it didn't really endure, as we know. I mean, five years later, we, we went back to um, the Tories for 13 years and uh, established a pattern we've known since. But the basic idea, which I think probably you and I both subscribe to, which is a kind of social democracy, um, a, you know, a form of socialism that... Uh, operates within an open market economy, um, I, I did need somebody who advocated that approach. And uh, the, the character I relied on was Erlander, who uh, really made a big success of the Swedish model. And I think when we now look around the world to countries that we admire and have made social democracy work, it's basically, it's not to Britain, uh, but to Scandinavia. Um, and Sweden particularly, but also Denmark, uh, Finland, Norway have kept this tradition going. And so I thought it was probably more interesting uh, to uh, discuss in detail the man who, more than any other, uh, embedded uh, social democracy in, in Europe through the Scandinavian experience. But you're quite right, I probably should have uh, highlighted one of the post-war Labour figures who, who did make a major contribution. And you look at Asia, uh, Deng Xiaoping, Lee Kuan Yew, two quite different figures, quite different size of countries, uh, for one thing. But let, let's take the China first. Uh, I mean, Deng Xiaoping has, has obviously transformed China, but in many ways has dictated the economics of the last 30 years in the world, uh, and particularly up until now, 
uh, the uh, virtual absence of inflation, uh, uh, partly as a result of Chinese goods coming flooding onto consumer markets uh, in the West. Uh, did uh, Deng have that in mind when he, uh, when he decided to back China on a new policy? Uh, yes, I, I, I think it's right we focus on him because certainly in my view, Deng Xiaoping is probably the most important political figure since the Second World War who made an impact on economic policy and the way economies function. I mean, an, an enormously important figure. Um, I, I think one, one point that I'd, I hadn't realized till I wrote the book, that his, his basic approach, he, he picked up from Lenin indirectly. He'd been a, a, a refugee from France. He'd, he'd been an agitator in France and had fled to Russia in 19, late mid-1920s uh, at a time when Lenin's new economic policy was being implemented and was actually at that stage proving remarkably successful. Well, Stalin, of course, sort of snuffed it out, but for a few years, uh, you know, Russia uh, recovered from the civil war, more communism. There was a market economy alongside its uh, communist government, and and Deng took that model and applied it in China. In other words, um, picking the best elements of a market economy, a capitalist system, uh, but applying it within a one-party state ruled by the Communist Party. Political discipline, but economic experimentation. You know, it doesn't matter, as he said, what colour is the cat, providing it catches mice. And catching mice was um, making the country succeed economically. And Deng's achievements and his successors, uh, you know, are barely credible, actually. I mean, it took this very poor country, now 1.4 billion, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, have now transformed China to a point where it now has a bigger economy than the United States. I mean, that is a, a staggering change. Uh, and I think more than any other figure is the one that, um, you know, I enjoyed writing about and, you know, admired, actually, as an individual. I mean, he's a ruthless man, absolutely ruthless guy, but he, he achieved phenomenal amount. And just a word... Uh... About Lee Kuan Yew, uh, not on the same scale, obviously, as Deng in terms of impact in the world, but uh, perhaps the, the, the most impressive economic transformation guided by a single figure. Yes, I, you're right. I mean, Singapore is a city state, uh, but what has happened over the last half century, more than half century, was almost entirely due to him. And of course, he, he had no economic background, he was a lawyer. Uh, he studied law in Britain. Actually, he was a Labour Party activist for a while when he was here. Um, he had no economic theories guiding him, but he was, although he was quite an arrogant man in many ways, he, he listened to economic advice um, and he saw Singapore's future um, as partly engaging with the world economy and taking a positive view of multinational companies willing to invest in Singapore, openness to trade, but at the same time, strong government. I mean, we often hear this nonsense in Britain, people talking about making Britain Singapore on Thames, a sort of free enterprise paradise. It isn't like that at all. It's a very strong state system in which, for example, pension funds are directed into, into public sector housing. I mean, that's you know, a large part of his economic model in a, with a very disciplined uh, bureaucracy, very honest, but very disciplined, um, but not, not as extreme as China, but very little tolerance of opposition. I mean, if you uh, speak up in Singapore, you're likely to get sued for libel or something by the government. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a free country in a political sense, but, but the enormous economic success. Vince Cable, when we re return after the break, we're going to look at a, a few other politicians who've uh, turned their hand to the, the written word. Join us then. Welcome back. Alex is in discussion with former Liberal Democrat leader Sir Vince Cable about his choices of the key statesmen and women over a 300-year period who have changed the world of economics and politics. Vince Cable, let's turn to some of your other work, because you've been pretty prolific, uh, mostly on economics, your own background, your own profession. 
uh, and writing. So you, you, you've been able to, you've been in government, of course, but you've been able to write about uh, uh, major issues such as the financial crash, partly in government, but partly observing from the opposition benches. Uh, so how do you combine these, uh, the, these two things? Um, well, I combined them partly because I, you know, I, I don't know whether I write well, but I certainly write fast. Um, and I've also had periods uh, when I've been relatively underemployed and been able to churn out a substantial volume of stuff. I mean, I, I didn't get into Parliament until I was 54, and uh, I lost my seat for a couple of years, so I, you know, I had that downtime to get to work writing. But, yeah, I, I, I've always found it helpful to be able to clarify ideas, to put them down on paper, and, you know, most of the stuff I've written is... A bit academic and has probably only been read by a few dozen people but th th there have been one or two success stories uh the storm that i wrote um in the build up to the financial crisis turned out to be a bestseller i mean it was the first book to appear about the crisis it almost certainly wasn't the best but it was the first and and um, you know made, made an impact as a consequence of that yeah very precipient i mean you're one of the people who who saw the, the gathering storm. Uh, maybe Alistair Darling read it when, they, when he gave his famous interview, saying people don't realise how bad things are about to get. Maybe you were responsible for the, the chance of the Exchequer suddenly recognising just the extent of the, the difficulties. So I can see that writing on economics as an economist, when you're on the opposition benches, uh, did you write anything at all when you were... Uh, a, a government minister when you were in the cabinet or, or were you kind of banned from doing that when you're when you're actually inside the room well the, the end of the, my period of five years i i did wrote a follow-up to the storm which is called after the storm which is more reflective and a bit deeper actually it's a better book though not many people have read it um, and interestingly enough, I, I first encountered um, Ms. Sue Gray, whose name has now become quite famous, because she was the, the, the censor of what we were allowed to publish. Uh, so partly, I mean, she was perfectly correctly. I couldn't uh, publish a book when I was still in government, uh, which was secondhand from government policy. Uh, but, uh, yeah, she vetted it and, um, and held it back for a little bit. But... Um, yeah, I did write in government. So Sue Gray was the ethics advisor on the cabinet office, was she not? And now has the, the prime minister's fate in the, the, the palm of her hand. But, of course, she had the fate of your book in the, exactly, in the palm yeah. of her hand. Well, was she a censorious editor, or did she, did she say, oh, well, that's all right then? So no, not at all. I mean, I, I, bizarrely, I think yeah. the only thing she had a problem with, I had a paragraph... Uh, in which which she thought might offend the Chinese government. I, mean, I wasn't quite sure why, but uh, particularly after I've written since, um, showing probably more sympathy for the Chinese government than other people. But anyway, that was the the only the only thing which she picked on that was problematic. And you did you did venture you you, you wrote a novel. Uh, I mean, was that a kind of departure? I mean, when you wrote the novel, were you were you sort of looking at it with envious eyes at the. Uh, you know, Nadine Doris or, or somebody who's <laughs> made a bob or two uh, from uh, uh, from a writing, or, or, or would you thought, oh, I'll try something different? You know, the, let's get out of economics into the into the political stuff. Well, uh, there is this cliche that we all have a novel in us, um, if, even if it's only one. I mean, Nadine Doris, I think, is a multi-billionaire. She sold millions of uh, chiclet books. In my case. I'd, I'd been picking up fragments of ideas, you know, pretty much through my life, and some of the more in, exotic bits of things I did. I mean, I was involved around the arms trade when I was in the Foreign Office, uh, and then later in government. I thought that was a good theme for some fictional stuff. Um, I'd spent quite a bit of my time in an earlier life dealing with India because of economic work and... My late wife was, was from there, so I, I, I had a feeling for the texture of life in, in Mumbai, for example, and I, I wanted to work these things into a, a topical novel, which is what I did, um, you know, when, I, when I, I, I wrote my novel five years ago. The, I want to ask you about your own career, and I've always been fascinated by the fact that in 2019, when you became leader of the Liberal Democrats for that period in 2000. 
and uh, 17 to 2019. Uh, you had, uh, you know, because Liberals had, uh, if we call it a, a post-traumatic shock from the coalition with the Conservatives, uh, and you became leader when the party was at a great low, but you had a significant success in 2019 in the European elections. I mean, so did uh, Nigel Farage's outfit and etc. But, but apart from that, you, you were the big gainers of that election. Uh, I've wondered why, given that uh, crest of a wave, did you then decide to uh, to, to retire from, from active politics? Because things seem to be going pretty well. Well, yeah, the crest of the wave was partly the European election, but it was rather more. We'd had a spectacular recovery in local government, um, probably the best local government results we'd ever had, and we were beginning to rebuild the party base. Now, the question about what happened after I stepped down uh, until the general election, I mean, there have been numerous analyses of it. It would probably, it might well have happened had I remained as leader anyway, because we were crushed by a combination of, you know, an anti-Corbyn feeling in, in certainly many parts, of, certainly in England, um, and also the fact that the, the, the anti-Brexit party, of which we were unambiguously one, were split, and the Tories managed to unify. They, they struck some kind of pact with Farage. Uh, so it was, you know, the Lib Dems, together with the Greens, Labour, and, of course, your party in Scotland, uh, on, on the one hand, and the Tories on the other. The dynamics of the 2019 general election, which in a way have defined future politics, perhaps for generations, were such that uh, we were bound to get, get hit. Um, and there was no real answer to it, because as long as Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, there was no way that you could have any kind of pact with them, as we're now beginning to work towards with Keir Starmer. I mean, that simply wasn't possible at that time. So, I mean, if you were the leader now, with Keir Starmer's type of politics in charge of the Labour Party, you, of course, as a, in your youth, a, a Labour councillor in the, in the great city of Glasgow, uh, that would be much more accommodating for, for your style of politics. You, you could see the, the, uh, the, the much talked about, vaunted coalition uh, with the Labour Party with a Starmer type figure in charge, which wasn't possible with the, the politics uh, in terms of yourself and, and Jeremy Corbyn. I think that's right. And I think, in a way, one of the most significant political developments in the last couple of years was last week, when there were, of course, these reports of a non-aggression pact. Um, I, I'm not close to it. I don't know exactly what's been agreed. Um, but if it is true, um, there won't be a formal alliance, but there will be a tacit understanding, much as there was in, say, 1997, when Blair came in and Ashdown did very well. Um, we, we could well get a recurrence of that kind of understanding. Um, and the consequence, you know, lots of things could happen, you know, the Ukraine war kind of stuff. But uh, on, on fairly plausible assumptions, I think we're now likely to get a Labour minority government uh, supported by some opposition parties. I mean, the Lib Dems, certainly. I, I don't know about north of the border, but, but, but that, that's, that seems to be a very plausible outcome. And you would welcome that uh, realignment of the left of centre? Well, I think it's desperate that we get rid of uh, the Johnson government. Um, I mean, we're, you know, the country's taken a very bad turn for the worst, I think. So I, I, I would certainly welcome a change. I, I, I would have some worries if I, if I were trying to run the country in two years' time. I, you know, Britain's not in a good place, uh, and, and managing that's going to be difficult. But we certainly need a change. and. Uh, the non-aggression pact, as, I, as it was described, seems to be a positive step in the right direction. Now, finally, Vince Cable, something I've always wanted to ask you, because there have been relatively few people on the minority benches who've really the, made a, a smash hit, the direct bullseye at Prime Minister's questions. But you were famous for your uh, Mr Bean 
uh, <laughs> remark. <laughs> and how did Gordon Brown react? I mean, he wasn't famously a, a forgiving personality. Did he, did he hold it against you for a while, or did he slap you in the back and say, all's fair in love and politics? Well, it was more the latter than the former. I mean, I don't know what he really thought. He never referred to it. I didn't. Uh, I mean, I liked him, actually. I mean, I was a bit of a fan of Gordon Brown. I thought, he was, you know, he had real integrity. Um, he really clearly believed in something. I'm not sure that Tony Blair did. Um, you know, he was a serious political character, and even now he's doing very good work and saying sensible things about global vaccination, the British Constitution. You know, and I admire the guy, so in a way I... Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm totally proud of the fact that I, I earned this missile at somebody that I, I rather rated. But no, it, it's it, it, I, I've kept broadly in touch with them. We have a good relationship. It's not never been, as far as I know, affected by that. And very finally, Sir Vince Cable, if you're asked to rank the, the three writing prime ministers, uh, Disraeli, Churchill and Johnson, which order would you put them in? Uh, well, I think Churchill, he ranks at the top. I mean, Disraeli, um, his style of writing, we wouldn't, we don't find comfortable today. I mean, it's, he made some wonderful quips. Johnson's, I mean, he's generally funny. I mean, many of his, his, uh, his articles, um, you know, <laughs> very good political satire. But I think, as we've discovered, that's not a terribly good basis for running a country. Uh, Sir Vince Cable, I, I note that, uh, of course, Churchill was the only one who was in the Liberal Party, but uh, we'll leave that to one side. But thank you so much uh, for joining me once again on the Alex Salmon Show. Sir Vince Cable was in politics a fair time, but at heart, he's an economist. Through economics, politicians have the power to transform people's lives for better or worse. The great ones have seized their moment. Deng Xiaoping lifted millions out of poverty by opening up China. Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal helped the USA break free of the Great Depression. Cable chooses 16 world leaders who transformed their country's economic fortunes and who also challenged economic convention. Money and Power provides an insight into the social science of successful governance. Given today's challenge of post-COVID inflation, towering figures prepared to challenge economic orthodoxy to transform economic prospects are in great demand, but short supply. But for now, from Alex and myself and all at the show, it's goodbye, stay safe, and we hope to see you all again next week.